Hello, good morning. Good morning, hello. Let's see here. Hello, everybody. Hello, Oran. Hello, Ibrahim. Good morning. Hello, Joe. Good morning, Paul. Hello, Eden and Sky. Wonderful to see you. Good morning, Renanova. Oh, 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 look, Lily says. Good morning, Lily. Hopefully, it's not a bad omen. Omen? Oman? 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 <laughs> Good morning, Mother. Good morning, Joshua. <laughs> Hello, Alex and Ridley. Oh, wow. Alex and uh, Ridley's auntie used to live in Oman. That's very cool. That's excellent. I mean, yeah, if you hadn't realized, today we're talking about Oman, which is why the Omen work joke works so well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hello, cat mind. Mm. We are joined by the mind of a cat. Uh, good morning, Milo. <laughs> Hi, Milo. Wow. Let's see. Let's share up where we're headed today. Here we go. We're headed to Oman today. <laughs> Good omen, Oman. <laughs> uh, hi, Steve. <laughs> um, ah, uh, Muda says that their dad went to uni in the neighboring country of Saudi Arabia. That's very cool. Yes, we are very close to Saudi Arabia today. In fact, let's start there. Let's see if we can find Oman on the map. We've got to zoom in quite a bit here. Here we are. So. We haven't really been to this part of the world yet. I mean, for those of you who are joining for the first time, the idea here is that every now and again, we do a lesson about a country and we're trying to get through the alphabet. So, so far we started in Australia. We've been all over the place, Mexico, Nigeria. Um, now we're at Oman. And Oman, as you can see, is here on what we call the Arabian Peninsula. So this sort of outcrop of land here between the Red Sea and uh, the Arabian Sea down here. This is where we are. And it's kind of a, a huge desert, I suppose, most of this peninsula. Um, Saudi Arabia here being a very big country with a lot of desert in it. And Oman, of course, is going to be pretty similar because they're neighbours and they're part of the same peninsula. Ah, now Paul uh, makes a good point here. Uh, good morning, Neil. <laughs> good morning. Um, yeah, there wasn't much choice for today. Because we're doing the alphabet, there is only one country that begins with an O, and that is Oman, which left me in a bit of a pickle because Oman, usually when I do these things, I know quite a lot about the country before I start. Uh, with Oman, I knew the basics, but I didn't know much detail. So I've had to do quite a bit of research to find out some cool stuff about Oman. Although I didn't have to find, <laughs> didn't have to research too hard to find some cool stuff. It seems it's a pretty cool country. Um, but yes, uh, Paul points out that there are no countries beginning with W or X. X is going to be a hard one. W, I can cheat. I can use Wales, which I know isn't technically a country because it's part of the United Kingdom. But at least I can cheat a bit there. With X, I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to do. I just... Mm, any ideas, let me know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good morning, Amani. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's a good idea. Erin, Janie and Willow say, the Christmas Islands, <laughs> spelt with an Xmas. Yeah, that could work. Maybe. I'm not sure if they're their own country. I don't know. Uh, Zaza land. I'm not sure, Abdul Hay, if that's a real place. <laughs> I'll have to find out, won't I? There we go. So anyway, we're on O today. So it's a while before we get to X, isn't it? Oman down here on the bottom part uh, and most eastern part of the Arabian Peninsula. And of course, because of our lovely, colourful map here, we can tell what continent it's on too. So we've got the sort of reds and pinks in Europe going into the purples of Asia. So Oman is in that section. So it's an Asian country. There we go. Um, now the flag of Oman is pretty impressive. Here we are. Uh, we'll talk more about this a bit later, about the specific symbol. But on the flag, we have three swords, two crossed, 
one in this cool J shape. And then we've got white, red, and green. So uh, a very cool flag, I must say. <laughs> oh, and Neil suggests I should write a book about a country called X-Land. <laughs> then I could do a, a webinar on it. That's not a bad idea. I could just invent a country. Maybe that's what I'll do for X. We'll do a, we'll do a fantasy one. That'd be quite fun, won't it? I'll just invent a country and we'll see what we can fit into it. Yeah, yeah, I'll go for that. Um, <laughs> ah, look, uh, Muda says, all the Arabian countries used to be called Arabiana. That's a lovely name, isn't it? Yeah, that makes sense. And they are very similar countries, not exactly the same, of course, but uh, when we look at the makeup of the people who live in the, the Arabian countries, uh, they are mostly Arab people, as you would expect. Um, not everyone, Oman has about ooh, almost 50% of their population are not Arab people. Uh, lots and lots of people um, live in Oman from India, and you can kind of see why. Um, India isn't that far away across the ocean, so um, in the time, uh, this is a bit of history here, Oman used to be um, a protectorate of the great British Empire, which means that the British Empire looked after it, sort of, you know, in the way that the British Empire looked after things. And uh, so lots of people came from India, which was another huge part of the British Empire, to live in Oman. Um, there we go. Uh, Amani, if you wouldn't mind, not so much in the chat, just because I can't see what other people are saying if, if you spam uh, a lot. Thank you. Um, oh, good morning, Lucas and Joshua. Wonderful to see you. Right. So let's, uh, we'll start with our physical geography today, if I can find that. Where are we? Here we are. We'll have a closer look at the map. So here we have the wonderful country of Amman, and we can see that here it is. It's in the southeast of the Arabian Peninsula. It's got some big neighbors. It's got the Yemen down here. It's got Saudi Arabia up here, and it's got the UAE, the United Arab Emirates, uh, just to the north and the west. Um, <laughs> oh, Xanadu, Oren. That would be a good one for X, wouldn't it? Um, is that Mongolia, though? Hmm. I'll have a think about that. That's a good idea. Um, so Oman, as you can see, is actually not just one big country. It is a big country, but there's another part of Oman up here. So it kind of stops being Oman, becomes the United Arab Emirates, and then becomes Oman again. Um, because uh, the people of Oman, they very much wanted this little bit of land here. It doesn't look like much, but it's incredibly important because this is a little part of Oman that stretches out into these straits here. We'll have a look at them a bit more later. But if you control the land next to water, you can get quite rich and powerful. So Oman have got the very pointy bit that points out into the strait, and that's where they are. Uh, they can make a lot of money there. So it makes sense that they have that bit. Now, if we were looking at a map of Oman um, ooh, a couple of hundred years ago, Oman would actually be much bigger. It stretched all the way down through Yemen, all the way down the east coast of Africa. They had quite a significant empire. But today, you know, smaller than that, nice and compact instead. Um, oh, uh, someone's saying it looks a bit like a face, the shape of this map. I don't know. I don't see it. But maybe if I stare at it enough, <laughs> I will. <laughs> oh, uh, good morning, Erin. Erin, we're doing Oman today. Oh, and the, yes, Abdul asks about the background. My background today, um, I am in a beautiful part of Oman. I'm next to a wonderful sort of technicolored wadi. Um, more on that in just a minute, actually. There we are. Um, yeah, I was quite impressed with this picture. So I think I might stay in Oman this week for all my lessons. I'm quite enjoying it, I must say. Mm. Now, there are some big cities in Oman. Uh, the capital is Muscat, and that's just here on the sort of northern coast. Uh, the second biggest is Salaa. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. Um, and you can see other cities around here that I'm not even going to try and pronounce because I might get them terribly wrong. You never know. Oh. <laughs> Milo says the shape is like a traffic cone. I don't know. I can't see the face or the traffic cone, but <laughs> um, so uh, let's have a look at what it looks like in relief so this map here it shows the same country it shows them on um but what it what we have here is a relief map so it shows us the high land and the low land now 
if you notice, if we just rewind for a second. <laughs> ah, hello, Sahim. Now, if we, yeah, if we rewind, you can see that most of the cities, they're in the north or they're in the south. We don't really have big cities. There are some small places, but they're not big. These are more like uh, small towns bordering on the villages. Um, and that makes sense when we compare it to our relief map, because our relief map here shows that to the north and the south, where all the people live, we have these mountain ranges. This one here a little bit lower, this one here quite high. Um, and in the centre of the country, we have all this lowland. So the, the deeper green colour on our map here, the lower the land is, whereas the more yellowy going into brown, the darker that gets, that means the high points. Now, our low points here, although it's shown as green on the map, don't let that fool you, you wouldn't see grass, you would just see nice sandy desert stretching all the way across in this middle part. And that means that people aren't going to live there in great numbers because, well, it's difficult to live in a desert. Um, as any of you who watched the, uh, the lessons on the kingdoms of the Sahara, um, desert living is not the easiest. You can do it in small numbers. You're not going to build any massive cities in the desert unless you have a lot of money and you can do lots of fancy things. Um, oh, <laughs> Joe has never been to Amman. Huh, same here. That's fine. <laughs> Um, ah, yes, and uh, Abdul Hay points out that it looks like I might be in the higher lands. I am, yes, this photo was taken somewhere in the northern mountains. I don't know exactly, but yes, well spotted. We can see behind me that there are mountains and hills rising up. So I must be over here near the coasts um, in the north in this case. Now, if the land here is flat and desertous, the really the best land in Amman, the, the land where you can build farms and build cities and you know have quite a nice time uh, are the lands that are protected by the mountains, not the mountains themselves. It's very difficult to build a city in the mountains. Some people have managed it, but it's pretty uh, um, it's pretty tricky. Oh, good morning, Clem and Gilly. Um, but the the safest, best land is in the shelter of the mountains between the coast, the the ocean here and the mountains themselves. That's where the nutrients sit. That's where the rain comes. That's where you can have lovely plants and greenery. So that's why most of the people uh, who live in Amman live, we'll rewind again, in our cities that are protected by the mountains in the north and in the south, not so much in the middle. Hmm. All right. Now, here's another picture, very similar to what's behind me today. Now. We haven't had one of these yet, these special countries, but there are a number of countries in the world who have no rivers. Not at all. Kind of crazy. Saudi Arabia, its neighbour, has no rivers. And Oman is the same. Now you're probably saying, hang on, Jake, that's ridiculous. You're telling me that I haven't got rivers and there's a river right in front of me. It's on the screen. Well, technically, technically, um, this is not a river. This is what, it, what we call a wadi. And the difference between a wadi and a river is that wadis, they're not always there. In the wet seasons, or when there's a lot of rain, the wadis come and they're beautiful and multicolored, like this one here, wending its way through the rocks. But when the summer comes and everything gets super hot and everything dries up, then the wadis go dry too, which means there are no permanent rivers in Oman. Instead, when it's wet and when it's slightly cooler, you do have water, and when it's hot, you don't. Ah, how do you spell it? Here we are. Um, oh, uh, Eleanor asks, did the mountain range have a name? I don't know. I mean, they do have a name. I don't know them. I didn't look it up, but I could do that for you um, if I get a moment. Here we go. Oh, and we are going to do some animals. Oh, yes. So, a wadi. There we are. So they look like rivers, they act like rivers, but they are not rivers because they're not always there. They come and go, uh, which again makes it really, really hard to live in Amman, especially if you're, you know, you might live in the middle of the desert, but next to a wadi, which is great when it's wet enough, but when it all dries up, suddenly you're going to be very thirsty. And as you know, we cannot live without water. Uh. Um, 
Uh, oh, Clem and Gilly ask, what are we working on? We're on Oman today. For Oh, there we are. Hmm. Um, right. <laughs> oh, I, <laughs> I might use my space pen if I remember, Steve. Yes, yes. All right. Now, the question is then, we've got a hot, dry country. We've already said we have no rivers. That makes things tricky. So how do people drink? Why isn't everyone dead? I mean, how can anyone live in a country where the rivers might just disappear? Um, now, uh, Muda says they could dig wells. And that's right. So back in the day, um, before modern technology, the people of Oman would dig deep wells. Um, and if you dig a well, you will find the underlying water, the water under the ground, and you can drink that. There are some problems with wells. The problem is you have to dig them, which is tricky. And of course, you have to put a lot of effort into putting a bucket down and then pulling the water up. So it's not perfect. Um, fine if you just live in a small village. But if you want to live in a massive modern city with cars and bright lights and all that kind of stuff, of which there are many in Oman, um, we need to find a better source of water. We can't use the rivers. Wells don't provide enough. So where are we going to get our water from? Huh. Uh, oh, that's a good question. Uh, we'll answer that question in a second. Oh, Muda says clouds. That's not a bad idea. Although, as you can see in our pictures here, they're not famous for the clouds. Um, oh, Joe, you're close there. That's good. So um, I've got a question here. Uh, are there no fish or animals that live in the wadi? There are. So there, there are fish who can sort of, depending on what the wadi is connected up to, you get fish that can enter the wadi when it's there and then sort of they leave when the wadi leaves uh, to go and hide in pools and lakes and things. Or you can have creatures, um, so creatures that don't live in the water, so not fish and things, who come down to the wadi to drink. And so they're going to, you know, because the wadis, even when they're dry, I imagine the animals can tell what they are. So they know that water is coming back soon. So it's a good place to live. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> Shaheem says they want to live there. Yeah, I, I'd quite like to live there too. It looks nice, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Ah, look, we've got some good answers here. and A lot of people got the right answer here. So this is a desalinization plant. And Oman has a few of these. I believe this might be one of the biggest. Um, so Oman doesn't have much fresh water. And it's got a lot of people, around 5 million people who need to drink. So it gets its water from the sea, from the ocean. Yeah, a few of you got it right. Well done. Um, which is something that is very difficult to do unless you have lots of modern technology. Ah, now, Muda says it is salty. Yes. So we, we cannot drink salt water. If you went down to the sea and just started drinking the water, it would kill you. You, know, you would get very, very sick and you would die because the salt uh, dehydrates us. So it takes water out of us. So even though we're drinking, we're actually getting more thirsty, which is a bit terrifying. Um, and of course, most of the water on the planet is salt water. So uh, the people of Oman have figured out, among with people in other countries too, they're not the only guys that do this, um, that if you put a big factory, what we call a desalinization plant next to the ocean, you can suck the water in and you can take the salt out of it. Now. It's kind of tricky to take the salt out of water, as you can imagine, because if I sort of picked up a spoonful of seawater and tried to put my hands in it and sort of take out the salt bits, it's not going to work, is it? Because it's all just one liquid. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Mudder says, hooray, you can now sell water and salt. It's true. You get water and salt from this. Yes. Um, and there are two main ways of doing it. Um, some desalinization plants, they heat the water up they make it really, really warm. And as it gets hot, the water evaporates. Brilliant word there. Well done, Muda. Yes. Uh, the water evaporates. It floats up into the air, or in this case, into machines that then catch the water. Now, the salt gets left behind. So you're left with a whole load of water that's evaporated, which you can then catch and cool it down and turn it into drinking water. And then you're left with a whole load of salt too, which is brilliant. The other way of doing it, um, which is even more technical, is to get absolutely, and I mean totally tiny, bits of, uh, well, we call them filters. So you get like a bit of plastic, which looks like it hasn't got any holes in it, but really it does. They're just absolutely tiny holes. And then you get a very big hose 
and I mean a big hose, a big powerful hose that is going to shoot that water really, really hard straight at that filter. And as the water hits the filter, the, part, the individual particles, this is how tiny it is, the individual particles that are water, they pass through the gaps and the salt particles, which is just a little bit bigger, they get held back. You would need a microscope to see them, yes. Um, so you can just shoot water at a, at a filter and the salt will be left behind and the water will go through. Um, I believe Oman uses a mixture of these two ideas. Um, even germs couldn't see it. I think they're bigger than germs. I mean, depending on the germ. I think germs have different sizes, yeah. But we're talking, yeah, so small that we wouldn't be able to see what's going on there. Because like I say, you can't look into a glass of salt water and see all the salt particles. But you know, if it's a tiny enough filter then the water goes through and the salt gets left behind and suddenly you have lovely, tasty drinking water, which is very useful. Now, there are several of these plants in Oman. And of course, once the water has been created, it all gets put into pipes and it goes off to the cities and the towns so people can turn on their taps and have a nice drink. I mean, whew, it's a fancy way of doing it, I must say, but it's very useful uh, and, and needed. Uh, in the UK, we don't do that. We don't need to do desalinization because as it looks like today, it rains enough. Yeah, we can just catch the rainwater and there's loads of rivers. There's rivers everywhere. Um, so we don't have to have fancy machines that turn salt water into fresh water. But in hot countries like Oman, that's exactly what they need. There we go. Um, oh, Amana asks, is this a pick or, or a real thing? Oh, this is a real thing. And you can see the size of the place. Um, if we look at this building down here, you can see the windows. So this is an absolutely huge, I'm going to call it a factory. It's not really a factory. It's, it's a plant, but it is like an absolutely massive factory where just gallons and gallons and gallons of water are coming in from the sea being processed and then going out as fresh water. And you need a lot, of course, because you're, you're feeding or watering five million people with these plants every day. And you can't stop them. You can't ever stop or people would die. You know, you can't go long without water, especially not in the Arabian Peninsula. Mm -hmm. um, uh, oh, Erin also says, don't you need to filter it uh, to clean it and not just get the salt out. That's true, Erin. So, and yeah, another good thing that pushing it through filters does is it takes out all the mucky bits and the germs and the stuff we don't want. So, yes, there we are. <laughs> ah, your name means trust. That's a good name, Amana. Oh, that's cool. I like that. Oh, excellent. <laughs> um, <laughs> and Abdul Hay says, we water plants and then plants water us. Oh, I see. Like a plant. Yes. <laughs> Get you. <laughs> Yes, that's it. A different kind of plant, but I like it. Yeah, it's not bad. <laughs> All right. Now, um, I'm not going to focus too much on the desert today, but there is one interesting thing, particularly interesting, about the deserts of uh, Oman. And that is that Oman is home to the largest area of quicksand on the planet. Oh, yes, quicksand. So, um, quicksand is what we get. Oh, oh, I better say, yes, the camel here, <laughs> our photo of camels here, we can see one, two, three, four live camels. I did at first think that this camel might be dead, but he's not. He's having a, he's having a nap, okay? <laughs> uh, this photo was taken uh, back in the very early 20th century by a British explorer who went out into the deserty parts uh, with local people like this guy here with their camels and went exploring and he came across this wide area of quicksand which is kind of dangerous. Um, <laughs> ride the camels to not sink. Unfortunately a camel will sink in quicksand, yes. Um, oh Aaron says that he didn't know that quicksand is real. Yes yeah, so, so quicksand is what happens when we get a load of liquid mixed, uh, usually water of course, mixed with sandy soil, so like you'd find in a desert. Now what happens is you find this in sort of low areas. If we think of, in fact I might go back to our map here, this might help us a little bit, uh, <laughs> ride a boat over it. <laughs> uh, not possible I think. So our area of quicksand is somewhere around here in Oman and what happens is the land kind of uh, slopes down from the coasts all the way down to this area and that's where a lot of liquid sort of stores just under the surface you couldn't like drink it but it is there so it's it's kind of wet almost boggy uh, sand but not quite boggy it's, it's hard to describe 
Now, when sand gets exactly the right amount of wet, it no longer is solid. You can step on it and sink right through. But you don't have to be too worried. Um, it's impossible to sink entirely in quicksand. You might have seen it on like the movies or the films or whatever, or on TV shows, or cartoons, uh, people sinking in quicksand and it's like covering their heads. Um, in real life, it doesn't work like that so much because generally speaking, your average human will sink down to their weight or, or the top of their, uh, their torso. And because of the density of humans and quicksand, they would just sort of stop there. And that doesn't mean it's safe because if you're stuck nearly up to your neck in quicksand, you can't get out. It's really, really difficult unless there's people with you to pull you out. So if you did wander alone into the area of quicksand and stand still and let yourself sink, you would be stuck. And of course, if no one was there to rescue you, you wouldn't be able to get a drink, you wouldn't be able to eat any food, and eventually you would expire. So it is a dangerous place, but maybe not as dangerous as the cartoons say. You know, in the cartoons, you kind of sink down until you're stuck under this quicksand and you can't get out. Oh no, not quite so dramatic. Um, but it does mean that if you, uh, ah, no, Amana says, uh, I thought camel's big feet can take it. It depends how quick the quicksand is, I suppose. So uh, in some areas, yes, maybe a camel's with his wide feet would be able to step over. Um, but if it was particularly wet quicksand, then even the camel would sink right down. Um, <laughs> Yes, in cartoons you suffocate, but not in real life, no. <laughs> um, it does mean it's impossible to take a car through, though. So if you wanted to drive across the desert, like some people like driving across deserts, um, and you entered an area of quicksand, well, you've lost your car, I'm afraid, unless you happen to have a friend with a tow truck who lives in the middle of the desert. Yeah, that car is gone, so... Mm. And a bit like, yeah, Eva says it's like polar bears with their feet in the snow. That's right. Um, but yeah, depending on how quick the quicksand is, even a camel couldn't get across it. The trick is, of course, if you step in quicksand, to just step out of it very quickly before it, before you do. You would have to stand there for a, for a few seconds at least, if, if not a couple of minutes, before you properly sank. So most people, they'd step on it, go, oh, no, that's quicksand, and then just step backwards. Yeah. So it's not that dangerous if you're aware that it's there and you don't get silly, I suppose. Yeah. Oh, and Erin says, why is there snow here? No, so this isn't snow. Um, this picture is just old black and white. So that the yellow sand just looks like snow. I see what you mean, though. Yes. So the, yeah, this isn't snow. This is uh, sand, just a very old photo. There you go. <laughs> oh, and I think uh, Abdul Hay is asking, why is there a little yellow book? I think it's just to show the scale so that we understand how big the patch of quicksand is here. Um, this isn't the entire patch of quicksand, by the way, not the biggest patch of quicksand in the world. Um, it spreads for a huge area, uh, but some of those areas are f quite uh, firm. You could walk across, where suddenly other areas you just like thump, go straight down in there. Um, so yeah, the book is there just to show us this is a big patch of quicksand. It's not just a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's our physical geography. We've got wadis, we've got desalinization, we've got uh, wonderful quicksand. But let's have a look at some of the creatures that we would find. Oh, I'm all over the place here. Here we are. So here's our wildlife. Now, um, the national uh, animal. So remember, every country has um, a national animal, one that represents the country itself. Um, sometimes they have them on their flags, but not always. Um, in Britain, we have the lion. Oh, uh, in England, we have the lion. In Scotland, the unicorn. In Wales, the dragon. Uh, the chicken of France is probably my favourite, the noble chicken of France. Um, but in Oman, we have the oryx. The oryx is our creature here, and I just realised I haven't written it up. Um, oryx. There we are. So the oryx <laughs> it is it's an oryx um it's got these wonderful long horns which i don't know if this is just a coincidence but they remind me of the two swords on uh the amani flag the two that are sort of crossed um I, I that mine might be reading too much into that but it they remind me of the the swords those horns of the oryx and this is a creature which is very hardy and can live in the desert uh which is very useful because amani is mostly desert there we are um, uh, Neil says that the national animal of Scotland is actually a haggis. Hmm. I'm pretty sure it's the unicorn. It was the last time I checked anyway. Maybe they've updated it. 
I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> um, oh, and Clement Gillies suggests that this may, might be one of the animals that the unicorn was based on. Yes, maybe early explorers, maybe in ancient times, they saw an oryx from a distance or maybe saw an oryx who had snapped off one of its horns and were like, aha, a unicorn. Yes, I wonder how magical it is. Um, perhaps, yeah. I, I haven't heard any specific stories about that, but it would make sense, wouldn't it? Hmm. Um, oh, Erin says, do I have a picture of a baby one? Well, I, I don't, but I'm going to bring one up because um, <laughs> I don't know what an Oryx baby is called. So I'm just typing in Oryx baby and we'll see what happens. Um, oh, I've got a cute one here of an Oryx with its mother. So here we are. <laughs> I should definitely just do baby animals. Um, Amani is shouting, it's a goat, it's a goat. It's not a goat. It's related to the goat. It's like a goat, but there's a little baby there, look. Very cute. Um, I don't know what you call an oryx baby. Maybe it's a fawn or a... <laughs> I don't know. Uh, oryx... I don't know what they're called. I can't see a name here. Oh, but it is cute. Yeah, maybe a calf, yeah. Or a kid, because they are very much like goats, aren't they? Yeah. Um, they are... Uh, a type of antelope more than a type of goat though so i don't know i don't know what the baby antelope is called either but pretty cute eh? <laughs> a calf yeah it could be a calf couldn't it um it reminds me a bit like a deer as well so it could even be an oryx fawn I, I don't know how it works i'll have to find out hmm. all right um now one of the most rare creatures that we find in oman is something quite special these creatures are sadly very endangered um and very few of them live in the wild anymore. Um, there we go. <laughs> ah, no, so, someone's pointing out that the picture is on mud. Yes, it could well be that it's either in a zoo, although there are areas of Oman that are muddy, that have soil, and it's not all sand. Yeah. Wow, my sizings have gone all weird today. There we are. So this here is the Arabian leopard. Um, there are lots of different species of leopard around the world. The Arabian leopard is one of the rarest, and Across most of the Arabian Peninsula, so in Saudi Arabia uh, and the UAE, uh, there are no more of these in the wild. But in Oman, they think there are still a few pairs that hang around. But as you can see, they're perfectly suited to camouflage. Um, if this guy didn't want to be seen, uh, it wouldn't be. Its fur is the same colour as the ground around it. And those spots all over its body, they... they make it really confusing to see from a distance. It's just, you can't see any solid shapes. It's just like blobs. So uh, this guy, uh, this leopard here, she could, uh, yeah, be very, very sneaky. A good hunter for sure. Um, but it's sad that there aren't that many left in the wild anymore. Hopefully they'll come back. Mm. Um, oh, Erin uh, says that the baby Oryx is called an Echila. That's cool. That's very, very cool. There you are. And a Kyla. I like that word. Yes, that's a new word for me. Mm -hmm. uh, Abdul Hay says it looks like his cat. Yeah, that's you've got a very pretty cat. Mm, very good. So that's our Arabian leopard. Now, not all animals are particularly safe in Oman. Um, we've got the trusty camel here. We've seen a few of those already. They're pretty safe. They help people travel across the desert. And uh, they're also, how do I put this? They're also quite tasty, apparently. Mm, lots of nice recipes that you can make using bits of camel. Um, but you might want to see a camel because they would help you. And you can ride the muda. Yeah, for sure, people ride them across the desert. Um, the one animal you're not going to want to meet is the saw scaled viper. Ooh. Um, so this creature here is one of the most venomous snakes in the world. They are particularly dangerous well in fact it's not even the most venomous snake in the world it's the, the most venomous for uh in uh in oman but there are more venomous ones if you go deeper into africa or australia and places like their poison their venom is more powerful uh oh hello abeda but this guy is one of the most dangerous because although it's not one of the most venomous it's the one that kills the most people um or one of the one that kills the most people certainly in oman and the reason for that is that they're venomous, their bite can kill you quite quickly, and they have a habit of hanging around near people. 
most snakes don't you know most venomous snakes that they're, they're out there in the forests or they're hiding under rocks these guys they like to come into the cities or near the cities they like to be where near where people are which means that you could accidentally bump into one of these things now they don't run around the street or slither around the streets trying to get people that isn't their business but if you accidentally startle one it will jump out and bite you and because they are around people about 500 people end up getting bitten by them in Oman each year on an average year um, now a lot of those people because Oman is quite a well-off country uh, they don't all die they can get to the hospital quick enough and the hospitals have anti-venom um, uh, oh, I'm being asked here, why is it called a sore scale viper? I'm not sure what that word, what the, I imagine it's because of the pattern of its, of its scales and its back, they kind of look like the teeth of a saw, I guess. Yeah, but that's me guessing now. Uh -huh. um, uh, so yeah, these guys, uh, they are dangerous for sure because there's a good chance, it's not like many people go through their lives without ever meeting one, but there is a good chance that if you disturb it, it will bite you. And because they hang around near humans, that means that yeah, people do get bitten. Um, Joe says that uh, there in the Malvern Hills, they have adders. Yes, so in, in Britain, we only have one species of venomous snake and that is the adder. Um, and we're pretty lucky because the adders, they very rarely go near where, near where people are. Um, people who generally get bitten by adders are people who are you know, maybe tromping through a bit of wild land, a bit of scrub land or something, and they accidentally step on one or near one. And even if you do get bitten by an adder in, adder in Britain, it's mostly not fatal. Um, you can, you know, assuming you're with someone, you could just drive down to the hospital quite leisurely and they'll, they'll sort you out. Um, whereas if you're bitten by one of these, you've got a few hours to get to the hospital or you'd be dead. Um, uh, that's it, Maria. Yeah. Uh, let's see. I, I've, I've gone behind on my chat here. Ah. ah, Rebecca says it's called a saw scale because of the noise it makes when it rubs its scales together. Oh, that's cool. Like a saw. That makes it slightly more scary, if you ask me. Something like, oh, yeah, that scared me a little bit. <laughs> Thank you. A few people told me that in the chat. That's wonderful. There you are. <laughs> so, yes, it makes a sawing. Oh, that's uh, that's frightened me a little bit, I must say. Ooh. <laughs> um. <laughs> Um, oh, and Clement Gilead asked, are they only in Oman? No, they're all over the place, actually. Um, uh, they are the most dangerous in Oman. But yes, you can find them all over the Arabian Peninsula. I believe you can find them in India, too. So if you go across uh, Asia, you'll still find uh, different varieties of school sex, saw scaled vipers, too. There you are. Uh, so it's not just an Omani thing, but I thought it was interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and then off the coast, we have wonderful creatures too. The Arabian Sea is absolutely full of life because a lot of the Arabian Sea is quite shallow. Not all of it, but uh, because it sort of snakes up around different countries, we've got a lot of what we call the sunlight zone, the areas of the ocean where you get find the most fish and the most creatures. Aha, now this here is a whale shark, the biggest type of shark. And uh, someone in the chat is telling me they're actually a giant fish. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Um, so here our whale shark is, uh, I love these animals. I love them because of their patterning and the fact that they're ginormous but peaceful. And off the coast of Oman, the whale sharks, well, they're a bit of a mystery. People aren't quite sure what they do. We know that they dive deep down, out of the sunlight zone. They go down into the dark depths, but scientists are still a bit divided. We're not entirely sure why they do it. Most fish, they sort of stay near the surface. That's where they find their food. That's where they eat. The whale sharks, they'll disappear down. And no one knows why. Do they have their babies down there? Is there special food down there? Maybe they're just playing down there. We don't really know. Um, oh, and Armani says, does it have spots or is it sunlight? Well, it's spotty, but we've also got the sunlight playing on it as well. So it's a bit of a combination, this picture here. Yes, but the, the actual little white spots, they're all spots here. But maybe the lighter glary areas that's from the sunlight. Yeah, good question. Hmm. Um, so a whole load of lovely animals in Oman too. Now let's, uh, let me, uh, um, yeah, yeah. got to press that button. We're going to come up here and we will uh, see if we can find out about the government. Da, 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 da. Now, Oman has 
quite an interesting government. Most of the countries we look at have a similar sort of government structure, prime minister or president or both. Um, in Oman, we don't have either. We have a sultan. Um, a sultan is, I suppose, the closest thing to a king, I suppose. Um, very, very similar. A sultan is a person who has the power over the country. And I've got here on the screen the last three sultans of Oman. Uh, we have Said bin Taimur. He used to be a sultan. Then we have, and I'm not very good at his name here, but I think it's Qaboos uh, bin Said as Said. And then we have the current sultan, the one who is uh, who's with us today. That's Haytham bin Tariq al Said. Now, these three guys, they kind of give us a nice bit of the modern history of um, uh, Oman. And uh, yeah, and bin means son, that's right. So yeah, we can see here that uh, Qaboos bin Said is the son of Said, whereas Haytham bin Tariq al Said, he is the son of Tariq, which tells us that they are not uh, he is not his son. Yeah, there we are. Um, oh, and Steve asked, what's the religion? So the majority religion in Amman is Islam. Um, in fact, they have a, a special kind of Islam, which the name escapes me now. Um, but it's not quite Sunni and it's not quite Shia. It's a different one again. Um, so it's quite a, a, a I'm going to say, rare type of Islam compared to the big Sunni and Shia uh, schools of, of Islam. Um, although there are Sunnis and Shia too, because there are people who live there who originate from uh, Iran, which is uh, Shia, and there are people who originate from uh, Sunni countries too. So there is a big mix. There are also lots of Christians and uh, quite a few Hindus too, because of course, uh, of all those Indian people who came from India during the time of the British Empire, they have their own uh, Hindu temples, their mandirs and stuff. So it's actually quite a mix of religion, but the majority is, is Islam. Now, uh, the, these three sultans, they tell us a bit about what it's like to have a sultan, I suppose. These guys had complete power. And Said bin Taymor, when he took over in, the, I think, the 1950s, he wasn't a great sultan, it would seem. Um, he started off all right, but his country was quite poor and he didn't really make it much better. Um, when he was the sultan, there were only three schools in the whole of the country, which means that most people were not learning to read, write, you know, learn about maths or other countries or anything like that. Um, uh, in the 1950s, there was a, uh, an attempt by some people in the city of Doha to uh, take down the sultan. They rebelled and he needed help from the British government to stop that rebellion. So soldiers from Britain came in and they fought together with the sultan. But after that, the Sultan wasn't quite the same. He started getting scared, paranoid. He started thinking that everyone was trying to get him. Everyone was trying to kill him. Ooh. So he started making strange laws. He stopped people from being able to meet each other for more than 15 minutes at a time. In case, of course, they started plotting to kill him. He banned people from wearing sunglasses because he said, if you're wearing sunglasses, you might be acting like a shifty spy. Ooh. He banned people from smoking in public because he thought that those people out there smoking their cigarettes might actually be plotting against him. You see how this goes? So the country, uh, people ended up quite scared and worried and uh, he kept making more and more strange laws until in the year 1970, he was taken down by his son. So his son, Kabus here, he, he gets rid of him. He says, with help again from Britain, uh, the sultan, he gets sacked as sultan which isn't really an easy thing to do, but he is. He's taken away to England and he lives the last two years of his life in a nice, very posh hotel in London, the Dorchester, um, uh, which in some ways is good because he has a good two years of his life, but in some ways is bad because he's lost his power and he's not allowed in his country and his son has taken over. There we are. Um, now, uh, then under uh, Gaboos here, we have, uh, here's a picture of him with the Queen. There we are. So showing again the links between the two countries. Um, the Queen is supposed to be a personal friend or was a personal friend of the Sultan. He is sadly dead now, but um, she would visit him lots. Uh, there were several visits over the last few years between Queen and Sultan. And I believe the Sultan has also visited England as well. Um, so yeah, they get on pretty well, as of course, Britain used to be a protectorate. So we used to have a lot of control in Oman. That, that, it's good to see that friendship still remains. There we are. So I'll put the Queen back down there. 
Now, when Caboose took over, he completely started changing everything up. He built schools. Um, Said he was very, our, our first sultan here, he was very strict. He said, people have to be Muslim. And if you're not Muslim, I don't really like you. Whereas Kabu said, no, hey, well, let's build some Hindu temples. Let's build some churches uh, for the Christians. Let's build different varieties of mosques so people can pray in their own ways. Um, he opened up loads of schools. He opened up hospitals. He started building these huge cities. Oh, uh, Aaron asked, who's the guy in the tuxedo? That's uh, Prince Philip, the, the queen's husband. You know, he looks like a, he looks slightly like a ghost there, doesn't he? But he's not. He's just very odd. It's okay. It's okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, there are, uh, uh, no, not King Philip. He doesn't get the name King because we can, we only have one queen or king. So the queen is the queen. Prince Philip is her, is her husband. Yeah, there's, there's all kind of political formalities there. Mm -hmm. Oh, it might be the Ahmadi Muslims there. I'm not sure. I, 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 yeah, I can't remember what the name was. Uh, I'll have to look it up. Yeah. Um, now, so he made the country bigger and bigger and bigger. He made it more and more free. He said, you know, people can have whatever the religion you want. You don't have to just be Muslim. You can be whatever. I don't mind as long as we all get along, people. Um, he, you know, told people that they could be more educated, uh, especially women as well. And so the country got richer and richer and stronger and stronger and more intelligent and more intelligent. Now we have desalinization plants and skyscrapers and massive roads. They're even building a railway, which is something unheard of in Oman. There haven't been in a railway before, but at the moment they're building a big one that's going to link it right up to the top of the Arabian Peninsula, go all the way through Saudi Arabia. So pretty cool. Um, but uh, our new guy who started just last year, one of the year before last, 2020. Haytham bin Tariq al Said, he's made it even more free. Um, just last month, Hatham bin Tariq al Said, he may started changing the laws a bit more. He said that it's now illegal for the government to check your Facebook pages or your uh, emails, which it wasn't before. You know, if the government wanted to have a look at what you were doing online, they could just have a look. Not anymore. Haytham bin Tariq al Said says people should be more free to do what they want and say what they want and dress how they like. So there you are. That's up to date news for us. Just last month, January 2021, Oman is getting even more freedom. So that's very, very different between, uh, say, bin Tamur there, not letting people wear sunglasses or meet outside, compared to Haytham bin Tariq al Said, which is, you know, everyone can just do what they want, sort of, as long as you, you know, don't break the serious laws mm -hmm. yeah it's not completely uh not completely free let's say <laughs> um so uh ah and, and joe says that Oman is one of the most safe countries in the world it is pretty safe yes it doesn't really have any enemies um it's it's you know there are lots of countries in the middle east who fight against each other and they argue and they they have wars and things Oman doesn't really get involved in any of that they're friends with uh countries like Jordan and Saudi Arabia at the same time as being friends with their enemies, the Israelis in Israel and the Iranians and India. So yeah, they seem to do a good job of just sort of being everyone, being everyone's friend, which is, you know, that's not easy, is it? Um, oh, Clement Gilly asks, how's it coping in lockdown? I really don't know. I didn't research that, um, but you know, I, I'm not sure. Hmm. It sounds like an interesting thing to look up though. All right, everyone's favorite bit. Econo economy and development and we're going to have a look at the gdp per capita whoa, whoa. Oh, it was just me cheering okay um now um every country in the world um can be looked at in terms of gdp per capita which means gross domestic product per person in the country now what we do to work this out is we take all the money from the country from everyone we just take it all Take it all and we shove it in a great big pile and then we divide that pile by the amount of people that live in the country and suddenly we find out if everything was fair how much each person would have now we do this in dollars american dollars because that's the world standard and to give us some idea in britain the average person at the moment um if we divided all the money in the country up the every every person would have forty two thousand three hundred and thirty dollars per year which is quite good. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not the richest. The richest that we've looked at so far in our alphabet is Denmark, which is now up to $60,170. That's a lot of money. 
per person per year. Now, Amman isn't quite that rich. It's only 15,343 per person per year. Um, so it's not the richest country in the world, we can see, but it's also not in the category of the poorest countries either. Our poorest countries down here, Liberia, oh my goodness, uh, about $2,000 a year. Um, yeah, something like that, you see. Yeah, maybe a little bit more with the exchange rate. Um, then we've got Ethiopia, another poor country in, in East Africa. Haiti, an island in the Caribbean, very poor. India, not doing so well. And Nigeria, relatively poor too. Um, but then you know, we start going up through our countries, Brazil, Kazakhstan, Mexico, China. They're getting a bit richer. And then we have Oman. So Oman is doing better than a lot of the countries in the world, even if it's not one of the richest. There we go. Um, but this means that the people are pretty well off. There are some very rich people. The country, the, the, the Sultan himself has a good amount of money, which means they can do things like build those desalinization plants to get fresh water from the ocean. And they can build schools and tall buildings and railway tracks. So, yeah, they're not doing too badly at all. And it means that most people there, you know, they don't have to worry about being hungry or um, not having electricity and things like that. You know, the, the people are generally speaking pretty healthy, pretty happy people. There we are. Um, unless, of course, you get stuck in the quicksand. But it's okay. Not many people do. Um, now, one of the things that makes Amman a pretty rich country is, as we said earlier, this strait that comes through here. Now, there's a very narrow piece of land. It's only about 20 miles wide. Um, it's called the Strait of Hormuz. And this is really important because the world runs on oil and gas. That's some of the main fuels that the entire planet uses. And every year coming in between this, this Strait of Hormuz is about 25 to 30% of the world's oil and gas pass through this on boats. And most of that comes from places like Kuwait and Saudi Arabia, Qatar, uh, big oil and gas producing countries. But of course, they can dig the oil, uh, dig the oil, they can suck the oil out of the ground, and they can suck the gas out of the ground. But that's no good, unless they can get it to the rest of the world. And to do that, they're gonna have to pass through the Strait of Hormuz, and then they're gonna have to come down past Oman. And of course, Oman takes a little bit of money every time they do that, which means that Oman can be quite rich. Now, if we look in a bit more detail here, it's only about 20 miles wide, but really the, the area that's deep enough to drive a big ocean liner through is even thinner than that. So these yellow lines, they show shallow water. So there's shallow water all the way around the peninsula here. Here's Oman, um, or the tip of Oman. And then there's shallow water all the way around here. So the ships have to be incredibly careful. They have to make their way through this very narrow channel, whoop, and then out to the ocean. And of course, they're going to need help from the sailors of Amman to do that. And that means that Amman makes a bit of money. Aha. Um, oh, what's this? Uh, da -da -da -da. Uh, Joe asks, oh, is it, is it Joe? Hello? Ooh. Oh, Steve asks, when's the next mythology lesson? I don't know. I'm kind of hooked on the uh, countries at the moment. So uh, hopefully I'll get back to doing mythology lessons soon, though. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, there you are. Joe says the world's largest shipping boat is a quarter of a mile long. Can you imagine driving that thing through this very narrow peninsula? It would be a bit scary. You'd have to be a bit of a legend, wouldn't you, to be able to do that properly? <laughs> With that, I'd crash it. I'd crash it straight away. And I probably wouldn't even notice for at least a <laughs> at least an eighth of a mile. I probably wouldn't even notice that I crashed it. There you go. All right. So let's take a, a quick look at some culture here. So we've already said that Amman's a fairly well-off place. It's a very peaceful place too. Um, it's not famous for wars and things like that. There have been conflicts, of course, because there have been in every country, but it's not like a, a, an incredibly violent place. It's pretty safe. Um, <laughs> and Joe says, this ship, when fully loaded, weighs a quarter of a million tons. Ah, that's good, isn't it? <laughs> now, having said that Oman is not a violent place, we may remember from the, the flag here that we have the cross swords and then we have um, this special kind of knife or sword. Um, it's curved completely. 
So you see it sort of goes down and goes up. And this is a real thing which many men in Amman wear. Now, it's not religious. Um, there are, you know, Sikh people will have kirpan daggers that they wear, and that's part of their religion. In Amman, it doesn't really work like that. Uh, the curved dagger is just to represent the country. So if you're someone who is Amani and happy, you know, yes, I am happy to be an Amman. I am proud to be an Amani man or woman. Mainly men, I think, wear them. Then you would wear the kanjar, which is the crossed, uh, the curved dagger. Now, it's not to attack people with. I assume it could be useful if you needed to cut a piece of string or maybe butter some toast, but it's not really a violent thing. Um, we're not entirely sure where this comes from. It seems to be quite an old tradition, but whether it was, I, I assume at some point they were used as weapons, but not so much anymore. But it tells us they're kind of important because they represent Amman, they represent the Sultan as well, and there they are on the flag. So if you were around one of these curved daggers, then you can uh, <laughs> then you can say you can show everyone that you love your country. I suppose in England or Britain it would be like wearing around a Union flag flag a Union flag a Union Jack flag um, on your hat or something. You know, if you walked around with that, everyone would say, "Oh yes, they're happy to be British." Um, in this case, you would wear the curved sword to show everyone that you are Omani, not Armani, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, that you are happy and proud to be so. There you are. <laughs> All right, so here we have. Um, now, uh, Amman is also home to many souks, um, which are wonderful markets. Uh, the markets, they sell pretty much everything. Um, uh, in North Africa, you probably call them like bazaars instead, but souks in Amman and, and around Arabia. And these are, well, I suppose nowadays we just compare them to shopping centers. They're places where you can go and you can buy anything from uh, a gold or silver statue of a camel, like here. We've got little chests, we've got loads of clothes, lanterns and stuff like that. Um, lots and lots of clothes. But you could also um, buy some you know, takeaway camel stew. Mmm, tasty. Um, or, you know, anything else you need, really. They're places where people go to haggle and to argue about prices and to buy all of the cool stuff that they want. There we are. Um, we also have, here's the, an outside of a souk, this area here, selling lots and lots of pottery. But what I've got this picture for is to really show what the colour of the buildings are. Um, all of the buildings in Amman are, at least all of the traditionally built ones, are either kind of sandy coloured like this or white. And it's not just because everyone likes sandy coloured buildings and white buildings, it's because it's actually against the law to have buildings of a different colour. Um, the Sultan very much wants people to look at Amman as clean and beautiful and very traditional. So traditional style buildings that you would have seen 100 years ago in the traditional colours of sandstone and white, that's all that's allowed. So you couldn't go to Amman and build yourself like a bright pink house or a purple shed just wouldn't work. You know, uh, <laughs> the government would say, no, you're going to have to paint that white or it doesn't fit in around here. So there we are. Mm. Ah, <laughs> thank you. Uh, Muda, uh, I'll come back here. That's, that's interesting. Muda is learning Arabic. So um, he says that the name of this shop in Arabic, if we're going to translate it in, in, into uh, uh, English, mean Muhammad Ali's cave. That's pretty cool. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> There we are. Uh, yes, yeah, so all the buildings, they stay this colour. We have one last little bit of culture to look at. Um, oh, oh, camel. Sorry, not cave. Sorry, Muda. <laughs> uh, Muhammad Ali's camel. That's what it is. It's the camel shop. Of course it is. I mean, that makes more sense because there's loads of camels in it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, uh, oh, Yusha says, are you allowed to build it out of sandstone and white colour and then paint it? No, the important thing, it has to look white. I mean, you can have whatever colour you want inside. You could have your pink, bright pink bedroom if you wanted. But um, no, on the outside, it has to stay with the government regulated colours. Yeah, so that everything looks the same and sort of looks clean and crisp, I suppose. I quite like the idea. Stops it looking all shabby, I guess. Um, now, our last little bit to, to point out is... The music, and it's at this point where I'd like to play you some music, but I find that tricky with the technology. Um, but one of the main instruments 
in Oman, and this is the same around the Arabian Peninsula, is the oud, which is a wonderful guitar-like instrument. And here we can see uh, an Omani woman and an Omani man uh, getting down and boogieing with the oud. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Seems quite fun, doesn't it? Um, oh, and Muda points out that the buildings have flat roofs. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you're exactly right. Because uh, he says there's barely any rain. So why would you need it to roll off? You wouldn't, would you? Yeah, perfect. <laughs> All right. So thank you very much, everyone. I hope you enjoyed this little trip around Amman. I very much did. And thank you for all your comments and questions. Um, and yeah, I'll see you in the future when we'll do another one. It'll be P next. Um, and I've got a couple. I can't quite decide. Is it either going to be Pakistan or Portugal? Um, hmm. I don't know. I'm going to have to give it some thought. Uh, I'm tempted to do Portugal because I've actually been there. Whereas Pakistan, I haven't. Although Pakistan is very interesting. So I don't know. We'll come to a P country in the future for sure. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Goodbye.